Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Musical Talk. I'm Lisa Woore and some of you will remember me from episode 44, Wicked Wonderful or Just Popular. This week's episode is coming to you live from the 2007 Edinburgh Fringe Festival with Thos Ribbets. Edinburgh has been the capital of Scotland since 1437 and the city was one of the major centres of the Enlightenment led by the University of Edinburgh when it gained the nickname Athens of the North. Edinburgh has a resident population of around half a million people, but every year for four weeks in August, this doubles during the world's largest performing arts festival. 1.7 million tickets were sold during this year's Fringe, making it bigger and better than ever before. Featuring a staggering 31,000 performances of 2,050 shows in 250 venues, with over 18,500 performers on stage and 5% of the programme consisting of musicals and operas, there was certainly no shortage of choice at this year's festival. 2007 saw a mind-blowing array of entertainment available and a thrilling mix of new talent and established names in the bill. Known for its controversy as well as its glitz and glamour, there's always something for everyone to enjoy at the Fringe. It's not all tartan and shortbread up here, let me assure you. Thos was lucky enough to spend what he called one of the best weekends of his life there, so without further ado, I'll hand you over to him. Well, the first musical I've chosen to see up here in Edinburgh has actually been a bit of a disappointment. It's called uh, Why You're Fat and Ugly and Everybody Hates You! exclamation mark uh, the musical of course interestingly it's described as following the story of 14 people living the critique of self-help books this sexy musical cynically explores the complexities of the modern relationship whilst one electrifying song follows another well in the sense that the songs are electric, you could argue that because they're pre-recorded, um, and unfortunately the actors and the actresses didn't necessarily keep in time with it. The idea is a good one. I like the idea of a, a self-help book and a musical. In fact, um, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying is a fantastic example of how to do it. Regrettably, Why You're Fat and Ugly and Everyone Hates You is not. There's a few nice lines. Um, there's a rhyme about being humped and dumped, and it's certainly very funny. It's a very young cast, and they certainly get the laughs out of the dialogue, but one doesn't necessarily find that it's worth listening to. There's a couple of halfway decent statements in it. Um, A young lady who's considered to be rather easy, a woman of easy virtue, described by a friend as, well, with the following adult quotation. "Uh, Your vagina should be on the tourist maps. It's always open and everyone's seen it. And there's also a rather interesting, slightly emotional story about a a woman whose husband has died and she's still in love with him and she's trying to find um, spice in her life by wife swapping. But her line is, uh, but my husband's deceased so you get the raw end of the deal. It's quite amusing. It was on the night. It's a very pastiche score. There's a song very much in the style of Bonnie Tyler called I Wish I Were Thin. Um, There's an a cappella number called Love's Got a Hold of Me. There's a number which sets out to be funny called I'm Irresistible which was quite resistible. Its biggest problem was it didn't really need to be a musical. So that's why you're fat and ugly and everyone hates you. Good to get that out of the way at the beginning, actually, in fairness, because it means all the rest I'll see will be a lot better. And the next musical I did see was Moby Dick, exclamation mark, the musical. So many exclamation marks this year. It was um, performed on a Saturday morning, quite early, half past ten, possibly one of the earliest times I've ever seen a musical, at the Churchill Theatre in the Morningside region of Edinburgh. I was lucky enough to meet some of the actors in the group, uh, Justin Birchall, who plays Ahab, and Stacia Sutherland, who plays his wife, and I want to pay particular praise to Aaron Eberhardt, who played Elijah, the mad uh, prophet, or over, uh, the, man, the man who can see into the future and uh, says things that people don't like, so they push him in the sea. It was directed by David Block, and um, the entire cast were from Anchorage in America because they came over with the American High School Theatre Festival. And I was lucky enough to catch up with Justin Birchall and Stacia Sutherland. Here they are. So, um, thank you. I've just seen a very fantastic production of Moby Dick, and um, you played a very significant part in it. Two roles, in fact. Yeah. See, this version of Moby Dick is kind of a show within a show. It's the story of a girl's school that is uh, failing uh, financially... Going under, in fact. Yes. Yeah, that has to stage a production of Herman Melville's classic Moby Dick uh, in order to f- raise the funds they need to f- prevent foreclosure. So I play the headmistress of the school, uh, who in turn plays Captain Ahab in their production of Moby Dick the musical. Which in full is a musical. drag, if I may say. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, so you, you play the headmistress and Captain Ahab. Right. She, in theory, it's a woman cross-dressing to play Captain Ahab. Although, of course, I'm a guy cross-dressing as a woman who 
cross dress as bad. Well, you wear a blonde wig and a, and a black beard. A blonde wig, black beard, big pair of boobs made out of uh, baseballs. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a show business secret, if I may say. Yeah, yeah. that is. Baseballs in the pantyhose. And uh, what drew you to this particular piece? I mean, obviously, you're, 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 the group you're with are doing a great many shows here at the Edinburgh Fringe this year. The American High School Theatre Festival brings shows from all over the country. Our particular cast only produces this one show. Oh, right. Um, so we've been preparing this show since this time last year, uh, and we did a per we're from Anchorage, Alaska. We did a performance of it in a venue in Anchorage. We did a run there, and then we brought it here. And the, the, the score itself is uh, very pastiche, isn't it? It, it? You're reminded of Gilbert and Sullivan, of Soul Numbers. There's right. a bit of Sondheim almost lifted wholesale early on, I think. Exactly. The, the, the whole thing is kind of a send-up of... Uh, of kind of, I guess what you would call musical comedy um, archetypes, yes. you know. Uh, so there's there's everything. Even there's a the little boy band song and the burlesque number. It's and a boy band song, but not many boys in the cast, of course. Right, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, well, that's the other thing. You is are the exception in this very much, you uh, and a couple of others. Right, there's quite a lot of cross-dressing, actually, because <laughs> all of the male parts in the Moby Dick are played by girls from the school. It's, it's, a, it's a pinnacle of sexual confusion. It certainly confused me, but then again, I enjoyed every second of it. Can I also just go over to one of your colleagues? Uh, your, sure. Your name, sorry. I'm Justin Birchall. No, I'm sure we'll hear a lot more of you, if I may say. Sure. Your name? Mine's Stacia Sutherland. Hello, and you play Ahab's wife in Yes, this. I was Asta. You, a very hilarious vamp early on, if I may <laughs> Thank say. You, you got very the audience much. going very quickly, if I may say. <laughs> very alluring. I try. And then you immediately throw yourself in the sea, so... Uh, yeah, it's disappointing in myself, but I come back a couple times from dead. You get a lot of laughs. Do you see the role as a comic role? Because it's actually quite tragic in the book, of course. Yeah, it is, but but really with the song you're given and the situation she's given where she's, as we were put, told, sexually frustrated, you just mm. make it the most that you can. That came across. <laughs> I'm <good>. glad. <laughs> <laughs> and as you say, you, you wander on every now and then wearing a, a net to show that you've been drowned. Yes, it's my seaweed. That's right. And you, you know, I noticed rather splendidly Moby Dick himself is played by a man dressed in white on rollerblades. Yes. And he came on with you at one station. I think you were intimately connected to that. We, we were. <laughs> That's actually one of the first times it's happened. It's happened many times. I've been attached to Ahab for a little longer than we were planning, and just it just keeps going, making Ned, it entertainment. It's such a difficult thing to it do. With, no, no. How many more performances of this are you doing here? This is our last one. Was that your last? Oh, I'm honoured to have been here. Yeah, thank you. What are your personal hopes to do? Are you going to stay in Edinburgh for a bit longer, or have you got other shows? Are you are back to America? We have to. I have to go back for school. Oh. But oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. I think both of us are going to to university in Anchorage. Uh, and our classes start in about two weeks. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. So, fine. Well, I wish I could wish you a happy summer, but, uh, <laughs> but we're standing here in the rain under a staircase for, <laughs> to save the recording equipment. Now, I want to say how fantastic it was, and thank you very much indeed. Thank so, you so thank much. You, thank you, and I hope to see both of you again at some stage thank on the stage. You. Let's thank hope you. so. And, of course, that was Justin Burchill and Stacia Sutherland from the American High School Theatre Festival. That's a particular organisation, which is here in Edinburgh this year, and they are putting on an incredible 48 shows, all musicals, including some famous ones, Disney's High School Musical, uh, Godspell and Hair, Les Miserables, the school's edition, I notice in brackets, Macbeth, that should be quite entertaining, Pippin, and also lots of musicals I've never heard of. There's the Rhino Provino, uh, a sideshow of the soul. There's The Secret in the Wings, so and, and various other musicals. Texodus, which uh, sounds very entertaining. I didn't get to see that, I'm sad to say, but 48 musicals. Um, and as I was speaking to those actors in Moby Dick, um, the doors had opened, such props as they had had been pulled out of one side of the theatre, and an entirely new group of people were going in at the same time. And it's like that all over Edinburgh. There's a flurry of activity. It's not just um, the fact that the population of a city has doubled um, with people wanting to see shows uh, and everyone is in the street happy and enjoying themselves and there are impromptu um, jugglers and people on tight ropes reading poetry and fire eaters, you name it, I've seen it. Um, but even at the theatres themselves, people are going in one door and other people are coming out the other as shows change over in a matter of half an hour. It's quite entertaining and quite interesting. You can sort of get a feel of what's coming up with the next show uh, just by looking at the stage door. So um, as that happened, I went back into the theatre and I was lucky enough to speak to Rachel, who's the administrator for the American High School Theatre Festival. Rachel, you work here as part of the administration of the theatre. I do. I work with the American High School as the box office yeah. manager. And they've got a lot of shows here for the Fringe this year, haven't they? How we many have. overall? Um, well, we've actually got um, three, six, seven performances a day every two hours from ten in the morning till tonight. Seven performances a day? Yes. Well, yes. I think that's really impressive. And uh, over how many weeks? Is that for the fourth 
That's we've got a three week contract here, so we have a full week, and then we have a lie week, and then we have a full week again. There's 600 kids in all, but we've got three venues in Edinburgh, so uh, we're rapidly expanding with the amount of kids who are coming from the states with productions. And this is an annual thing for your organisation. Yes, it is. We've been here for seven years now. It's very impressive, and the show yeah. I've just seen, which was Moby Dick, made me laugh a lot and was very entertaining and, and beautifully produced, if I yeah. may say. I thought, and that's just one of several shows, as you say. So, what's coming in next? We have a total cross-section of things. We've got uh, Gia de Huzi, The False Monkey, next, which is very similar to a Beijing opera. Um, we, we cover a whole area of things. Um, next week is entirely different. We haven't just got musicals, uh, and that's the beauty of it, because people who normally wouldn't attend the theatre, if we have musicals, would possibly come along to see something else on the basis of how good the last thing has been. And what's the purpose of the score? The school is to promote um, theatre and acting to the kids in the state. They pay a horrendous amount of money to bring their productions here, but it, it's also fantastic in our community as well because it encourages kids who, for the most part, aren't encouraged to go into acting or performance in uh, the UK, and they're, they're just so confident with it as well. Uh, certainly in Morningside there are so many parents, grandparents, three and four generations of people who come along, which is fantastic. So you've generated your own audience in a way. We have, yeah, um, because I, I think the, the nature of the way communications are today means that, that people are losing interest in theatre and it's very encouraging when you see something like this and children and grandparents coming along to the same performance with the same amount of interest in it. Splendid. Now, uh, particularly in relation to the musicals, I noticed that the show we just seen, of course, mm. for obvious reasons, was using recorded music mm. rather than um, having a live orchestra. And that's very. I, I saw a musical yesterday which did exactly the same thing. It's the yeah. way forward, I think. Um, but how do you feel about that? Is that? I mean, it's a logistics thing, I suspect, isn't it? Well, no. We have a pit there, and it just depends on on the group that come. Some bring their own musicians. Some use backing tracks. And that really depends. That, that's again, that's the beauty of it because um, for a lot of people who've never seen live productions, whatever, it's great in a theatre this size. We've got 343 seats. Um, some of the casts are, are just enormous, and logistically, they just can't bring. They can't afford it. And they just can't bring um, that. But it, it also gives the kids the opportunity of working with different um, environments, which is is really good. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, if I may say, I'm very grateful to talk to you. Thank you so much for your interesting comments. Thank you. Well, immediately after that, I snuck off into the um, a quiet section of the Church Hill Theatre where Moby Dick had just finished playing um, as people scurried around me about to get the next play sorted out. And I made this review of Moby Dick. I've just seen Moby Dick, exclamation mark, the musical, an excellent production put on by the American High School Theatre Festival. Uh, the plot is easy to explain. Described in the uh, fringe brochure as St. Godley's Academy for Young Ladies is broke, but staging Melville's classic as a musical might just save the school. Women whalers, janitor sailors, and a headmistress as Ahab. It's a whale of a tale. That's how it's been described, and I think that's a pretty fair description, actually, what we've just seen. It was clearly a school production, but a very professional school production. And the venue itself is a proper theatre based in an old church. Um, the stage was black. Um, there was a bit of scaffolding, which people used, and props were cleverer. A, a ship's wheel, uh, this is an old whaling ship of course, was made from tennis rackets tied together. Um, Captain Ahab's wooden leg was just uh, a piece of white bandage around one leg in particular. It starts before the performance itself. There's a janitor who walks around the stage um, before the show starts, uh, commenting and how awful the girls in the girls' school are. It has a feel of Daisy Pulls It Off, which is a, a show that's been in the West End a couple of times in the last few years, um, which is also about a girls' school which is um, suffering possible closure due to financial problems uh, and in that case it's solved by putting on a play and solving um, and getting treasure in this case it's by putting on a musical there's a fantastic uh, head teacher um, that's uh, Justin Birchall who comes on as the he uh, as a headmistress uh, once again dragged up uh, once again very much like Daisy Pulls It Off and indeed the St Trinian's film that's out later this year with Rupert Everett what's good is that all the actors in it are mostly female cast there's about four chaps and about 14 girls they stay in character throughout so they do business in the character of the girls playing sailors so it's very good all the way through it doesn't open on a number funnily enough there's an early school hymn which is performed very badly deliberately the opening chorus comes in about 10 minutes in and it's a very traditional um, music chorus in fact you suddenly realize that it's so traditional because the whole piece is a pastiche musical the heroine 
plays Ismail, like Velma from Scooby-Doo, actually. She's a slightly know-it-all girl. The wife of Ahab is very vampy. She doesn't have a huge amount of stage time, but she really eats the... Uh, well, there, there isn't scenery to eat, but she's very good indeed. And she does this fantastic soul number, which is called A Man Happens to a Woman. There's very amusing choreography, dancing choreography, but there's also pastiche, sort of almost pans people um, choreography. When Captain Ahab and his son are singing a song about love, they mime heart shapes. There is perhaps a touch too much sincerity in the piece. It's very funny when it's very funny, but just occasionally it stops and uh, tries to be sincere. The Madman song uh, on the beach, Elijah, when he's um, giving warnings before they set off, it feels like a Gilbert and Sullivan number. Some great lines in it, by the way. Someone goes up to Ishmael and says, have you ever been whaling fish meal? And she says, it's Ishmael, actually. Um, Captain Ahab utters the immortal lines, obsession is not just a perfume. A song about mutiny is done in a doo-wop style, very uh, little shop of horrors. When there's talk about mutiny, uh, somebody says, oh, I've got a severe cuticle problem that stops me killing people. And I have to say, the last line of dialogue before the closing number is the rather splendid stuff art, let's dance. Overall, a very entertaining, professionally done musical, a little rough around the edges in one or two areas, um, but I think that's mostly in the writing. Um, Very good show. Now, as I said in that interview, um, some of the songs seem very familiar to me, and I've realised since that the song, the primitive song, uh, which is sung by the cannibal in Moby Dick, is in fact the Macarena dressed up, and indeed the Sondheim number, which is called Small World in the musical Moby Dick, is in fact um, Kiss Me, which is He Means to Marry Me Monday, What Shall I Do, I'd Rather Die, uh, from Sweeney Todd. From there, I quickly hot-footed it to the Pleasance, which is a lovely area in Edinburgh, with plenty of venues and plenty of people, and plenty of alcohol I noticed as well, although I didn't have any of that, and I went to see a fantastic show called Newly, The Singer and His Songs, that featured David Boyle, and I was lucky enough to catch up with him after the show. David, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, it's a pleasure. First of all, why Anthony Newly? Because I've always been a fan of him. I've listened to his music as a kid. Somebody played a song at somebody's uh, Christmas gathering, I think it was, and, and I just it, it stuck in my head. And then we, we heard the songs from Willy Wonka and Dr. Doolittle and I didn't click at the time I thought oh, I just like the music sing along with it but then um, I found, later found out it was Anthony Newley and, and then that all started the ball rolling for me and I started getting into more of his music and thinking God it's not just his music great actor mime everything he did, he did the whole thing directed it's uh, such a talented guy your poster describes him as the lost show business superstar really I think he is yeah mm. yeah definitely I, I think when he went to America he kind of got lost in that cocoon over there doing Vegas yes. uh, and you could get lost out there and isolated and we touch on that in the show um, my own father always used to say they didn't, they didn't really know what to do with him no they didn't, they didn't he's such a quirky kind of character completely unique yeah yeah, yeah. one on his own um, but your skills if you don't mind me saying because um, you're, you, he can do everything and in your show you pretty much bring him to life in all aspects you sing like uh, perfect, you sing to perfection in the style that he sings and that's not an easy thing to do um, so I'll talk about that first. No, so how, go, how did you go. Discover yeah, you could do that. I had by accident. It, the whole, I, I must say, I mean, I mean, when you listen to all the songs all the time, it, it kind of must have gone straight into my head. And, 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 yeah, it's all there um, with all the mime stuff uh, that came naturally, and I, I kind of, I, and it does feel quite spooky because sometimes on stage uh, it feels like he's looking over and saying, "Yeah, you're doing all right, kid." You are communing with his yeah, spirits. Yeah, no, it sounds a bit, <laughs> bit wacky but no it did and that's how we did it in rehearsal that's how um, we got across some, some of the songs uh, and, 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 and the it's not an impersonation it just came naturally no it's n- and it doesn't no. feel like it. it doesn't feel like you're putting it on it just but it feels you feel you get the resonance with Anthony mm. really or I did and I, I thought that was excellent so. yeah because I, I mean I've heard the likes of Joe Longthorne and a few other like um, Rich Little doing them and, and they kind of yeah, yeah and they're impressionists and, and they're g- great at what they do but what they do is, is, is seems to be exaggerated I don't think Newly liked that so much of course he did have a reputation for having a very distinct way of singing of course which does lend one to yeah, be exaggerating yeah, yeah. in the way you do it yeah. or one does it probably well I think, I think I think he kind of caricaturised himself in the end and then yes. and that's why in the show we, we do th- a caricaturised version and then we bring it back down for I'll begin again and, it, and the I was going to say, tell me a little bit more about the show, because it's not, as you say, a tribute show per se, is it? No. um, Originally, it was going to be a tribute show. I read through the script with my director, um, and he he said, well, let's try and work some things out. And and we did just some improvising, and we actually did... uh, uh, We got Anthony Newley to come down and do an impersonation of me, doing an impersonation of him. 
<laughs> and, it, and he was doing it over the top. He'd go, ah, you look at the fool. <laughs> and over the top like that. And I went, oh, God. And that's where it came in, in the show where he says, do I really sound like that? Mm. And we can kind of keep these key moments we kept in. Um, yes, it's milestones in a way, isn't it? The yeah. That we get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I know it's only it's an hour long and we, you only get highlights of his life it's so hard to cram I mean he did so much Indeed. child well, child actor and everything so. well you said that right at the beginning of the piece yeah. that, you know, and I think as I say it's a real tribute to you if you don't mind me saying that you're able to keep up and do all those things because I have to say I, I really enjoyed the show from beginning to end oh fantastic um, and as you say you went, oh, I have to, I'm going to be absolutely frank mime isn't my first love no, nor I, mine no, <laughs> no. And no nor his he never liked that white face clown mm. thing and that's why we get rid of it but um it stuck with him throughout his life and it was kind of his trademark so you kind of use it if it sells and you, you kind of go with it don't you but he, he didn't want that to stop the world he wanted a big egg that would would illuminate life and they couldn't design it right it didn't look very good and so they got this clown makeup and that's where it all started really did you ever get to see Anthony Newley New- New- in real life no unfortunately I oh, wish I had yes. I'm, I really miss out there and as you say he could cover the range because I have to because uh, I remember I saw Anthony Newley um, with Joan Collins in a series of Noel Coward plays on BBC One and then oh, only yeah. a few years later he was in EastEnders yeah, which is from the sublime to the ridiculous yeah. in many ways <laughs> <laughs> it's such a talented guy it's such a, a shame that people say oh wasn't he, he married to Joan Collins and you think yeah he, he was and, and that was probably fabulous at the mm-hmm. time but he did all this body of work and wrote, directed uh, I mean along with Leslie Brickus obviously course. but I mean there's, there's other songs in there that aren't with Leslie Brickus and, and we use those composer and lyricist I think in his case I mean ly- yeah. he famously wrote lyrics didn't he and I understand he did l- yeah for Goldfinger ones, yeah. yeah yeah definitely for that I mean the film Hieronymus Merkin uh, that, that's a fantastic well I think it's a fantastic <laughs> film I mean compared to today's stuff you, well, you indeed, kind yes. of think oh hello they were doing that then <laughs> but he was always panned by the critics they always fell on him quite heavily and and, uh, and said about his exaggerated singing style and but genuinely loved by the public I think yeah absolutely and, and I hope that's shown by your show now tell me tell me a bit about the, the history of the show you've, you've just done it elsewhere yeah we did it at the etc theatre in Camden um, we actually we did it about a year ago as a workshop and, and we just did that down at the Actors Centre um, that was with my director Jeremy Stockwell and the movement artist um, Anna Bondolo yeah it was just a, a workshop just to see if people would like it and, and we left it all a while I think it was until February this year and then we came back to it and started touching it up and working on it a bit more and the Edinburgh Evening News gave it a good review a bit confused at certain things but it doesn't matter I mean everybody takes what they want and that's the beauty of it I think it is it's, it's a potpourri almost yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that's one word yeah, yeah. well, I must you, remember that you smelling sweet yeah, yeah, well. yeah exactly <laughs> And you did talking of sweets, you, you very kindly give the audience, well, you did in the performance today, I don't know if I can hold you to this for all four future no, I have gave been. the sweets. No, I have been, because I, I, I just thought, it was because we were going to cut the Candyman at the end, and because and, it was overrunning a bit, and then we thought, oh, what the hell. And, and, and with the sweets, I just on the way to the theatre, I thought, he gave out sweets, I mean, it's a great, <laughs> even if it's at a bribe or something, <laughs> <Yeah>. come again. <laughs> to be honest, I thought finishing with the Candyman's a great way of finishing the show, because it does leave you on an up, it's such a good, upbeat number, and yeah. you sing it so nicely, I have to say, because the, the, the story goes up and down, because Newley's life is full of successes and failures, or at least um, when he's not being appreciated, and of course, uh, in sadly, but you've got that nice little Philip at the very end, I think, so I think, I yeah. think it's well placed. Oh, thank you. No, no, we needed that, uh, it, because it all kind of came through improvisation. The songs came, and my director would say, right, sing a song, Tony. And me as Newley would do, do the song. And, and that, whatever song came first, in context of what we were doing, pretty much stayed as is. And we, we've moved one or two, but it pretty much has stayed as is. And where do you take the show next? We are here, and then hopefully we'll go back down to London for something. I, I don't know, but we'll, we'll so see. it's a case of keep our eyes peeled, because our listeners I like think to know so. what's going on. Yeah, so. no, no, but check the website. There's a website. And um, what is that website? www.newlythesingerandhissongs.co.uk and there's updates on there where we will be touring and, and hopefully um, I don't like to say anything too soon but there's, there is an American interest so oh, good. hopefully I mean he was big out in the States and everybody knows him there so. well, a lot of our listeners are in America as well so, oh hello um, then uh, thank you <laughs> I was going to say um, do catch his show if you can because I think it's excellent thank, thank you, you very much David Boyle thank you very much well I also saw the show uh, Newly, the singer and his songs, and I have to say it was very enjoyable. Uh, it lasted an hour as a live uh, pianist playing accompaniment, and when you come in, you find there's a man sitting with his back to the audience, uh, covered in an overcoat. And when's the sh- when the show actually starts, um, he sings from that position, and he, in the voice of Anthony Newley, very effectively actually. So, uh, then he stands up, 
um, takes the coat off. And of course, he's wearing the famous Anthony Newley little man uh, characterization makeup and it's like, like a, a Pierrot, a Harlequin, if you like. He's got w- uh, white socks, sort of uh, dance shoes, and a, a green checkered dungaree set. Uh, over a leotard and a white face and that was a, a persona that was adopted by Anthony Newley or forced upon him in Stop the World I Want to Get Off. The show itself isn't a tribute, it's a kind of a delve into some of the songs, some of the things that happened into Anthony Newley's life and also the effect that Anthony Newley had on David Boyle himself and he's quite upfront about that, he said this isn't a tribute show, he says it in the show itself, he says precisely how Anthony Newley affected him and how it came out under hypnosis, it's quite an interesting, um, if short, uh, d- uh, diversion into uh, d- uh, David Boyle's own life but the show is none the worse for that, it's not harm by not being a pure biographic replay uh, the songs are done exquisitely, really, quite masterfully. It does feel as though Anthony Newley is in the room, without being exaggerated. So it's, it's not an impression show. It really does. Uh, it, it, it gives you the sense of Anthony Newley. Um, Anthony Newley uh, is characterised sometimes in a pre-recorded voiceover, which speaks to the David Boyle character. And so occasionally the focus shifts from being a one-man show, David Boyle as Newley, to David Boyle as himself, with Newley speaking to him. Uh, but it's not too complicated. I think you'd uh, have no trouble keeping up. I didn't. And I say it, the show is ultimately uplifting, even though um, very sad, because ultimately Anthony Newley dies not in obscurity, but um, not famous in the way that perhaps he ought to have been, uh, of cancer. The show does rely very heavily on the sentiment, but then again, uh, on sentiment, but then again, Anthony Newley's characterizations always did that too. So it's entirely in keeping. A highly enjoyable show and to be recommended, I think. There were lots of trends which uh, were very obvious in this year's uh, collection of shows, which I saw at the Fringe Festival, um, not least projection. But there were also lots of doubles. Interestingly, I saw at t- least two shows that had not just um, projection, but uh, pre-recorded video projection, i.e. real film rather than animation, uh, used to link sections of the plot. Um, I saw at least two musicals that started off with a chorus of Russian, uh, Russian peasants with a bit of mournful violin music. And I saw at least two musicals about former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. One of those shows was able to do the double. Tony Blair the Musical, which I have to say is one of my picks of the festival, started with the Russian Peasant Chorus and some excellent violin, and of course was about former Prime Minister Tony Blair. So let's hear a little bit of that lineup of Russian Peasants and some mournful violin from James Lark. Sleeves they're heading for 
can see Showing on my swingometer Who's getting a majority It's not clear which way to swing But if you'd let me coin a phrase Politics are unpredictable Because some people swing both ways I'm now in an opportunity to meet Not just one of the significant actors in it But also the composer and lyricist If I may say, James Lark So James, thank you very much indeed Very nice to meet you Now tell me a little bit about the show How did you get the idea? I had the idea years ago um, and I think there's sort of two sides to this coin. The, coin. the first is that I've, I've written a lot of satire over the years, uh, various articles for people, became quite a cynical teenager and, and out of this developed a, a genuine interest in, in politics and uh, also a kind of despair often. Um, but uh, yeah, I, so for a start I felt that it would make great subject matter and I felt that it was something which could be both very, very funny but also very topical, very um, very important, I guess, I, uh, if that's not uh, being too, too portentous or too pretentious. Um, I, I like to think there's an actual reason to, to, to write music about this kind of thing. The other um, side of the coin is that I've done Edinburgh. Uh, this is my fourth time in Edinburgh, and I'm just a little bit fed up of doing shows to people, you know, 15 people in the audience, when uh, it's very clear that all you need is a gimmick and you can actually get quite big audiences in. When did you realise you were going to have a success? Because this has been a sold-out show, and indeed... Well, um, it only very recently, re- and, and even now I'm, I'm not getting too complacent because, of course, the fringe is really unpredictable, and I have done shows which have done very well in the first week, and then suddenly audiences have, have just plummeted. I hope that's not going to happen, and I think that we've now... There's enough word of mouth and enough, certainly enough publicity out there that we can do very well. But um, it's been a, a nerve-wracking few months because um, I pretty much bankrolled the whole thing myself. Oh, really? Well, this is the state of arts funding in the country. You it's don't not, really yeah. get people to pay you to do shows. You have to do it yourself. And I felt like it was a calculated risk. But on the other hand, kind of the number of hidden costs there are for Edinburgh, it's, it's been a... Even though we're not, um, we're not paying our cast are all kind of young mm. professionals we are obviously paying for their transport and accommodation and expenses but which does it, rack up it really does rack yeah. up and uh, you know just simply getting a house that's big enough for the ten of us huge cost so i've been i've had a few sleepless nights over over this show well i'm glad it's come right now um you didn't just and i'll talk about the writing process in a minute mm-hmm. if i may but um you play gordon brown in it, i do yes a not insignificant character in british politics i've noticed recently <laughs> He's done rather well, hasn't he? Yeah. Uh, presumably, well, first of all, Mr Blair's been very kind to you and resigned at exactly the right <laughs> time. But how do you, how do you approach uh, taking uh, Gordon Brown and also the, the twist you've given him, which is the sort of, I'm going to use in speech marks, spurn lover? <laughs> well, yes, many thanks to Tony Blair if he's listening for resigning at <laughs> oh, just, does, just the right time. He's got time uh, in his hands now. <laughs> I know. He, I wondered if he could play the part himself, but um, I'm not sure he's got the singing voice. No, I, I, I always saw their relationship as one of the most interesting things. And dramatically, it's a bit of a cliche to say that you need a, a, a strong relationship at the centre of a piece of drama. I don't think it's necessarily true, actually, but I, but I do think it helps. And people have been saying to me, why, why isn't Cherie in it? It's just, actually, she's not the relationship I'm, I'm interested in there. You know, this is about, you know, we're not, we're not really doing anything crude. We're not suggesting that they're, they're, oh, no. they're sleeping with each other. We're just saying that, 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 that here is a really strong friendship, which really goes sour. And that, for me, is really, and a really interesting dramatic device. And also the kind of device that illustrates what's happening on a broader scale because the other thing that's very important in the show is actually the chorus mm. the, the showing the media and the, and the general public well, and I, want, I thought it, sorry I'm interrupting you well, yeah, I do like the fact that Fourth Estate comes into it that, you know that everyone is absolutely. held, um, it just held up to the light fr- very early on I realised this was going to be vital because I think Gordon Brown's one big solo number is the first thing I wrote and that was because it was that was obviously kind of very uh, early on I had this idea of, of the Brown Blair relationship being in the, in the middle of the musical but just as I wrote, the, the, the more I wrote, the more I realised that it was going to be a very chorus-heavy piece because Blair's been so defined by the media and so defined by his public. And so I, I really like the way that his deteriorating relationship with Gordon Brown is mirrored in his deteriorating relationship with the public. And he's kind of left uh, at the end this tragic hero, tragic f- figure. Now tell me, um, the audience I noticed, um, a full audience as we said, a, mixed, a whole mixture of ages, although yes. possibly a slight tendency towards BBC Radio 4 listeners. Well I yeah, think. absolutely, we've had, a, we've had quite a lot of the older generation in which, it's funny, I, I guess my observation about the fringe is that younger people come up and go to mostly see stand-up comedians, maybe because they're bigger names. There seems to be a bit of, I think probably justified cynicism amongst the, the fringe press about this kind of show, because they do see it as a gimmick, um, and that's something I pretty much knew was going to happen so there's, there seems to be a, a bias in a lot of fringe press anyway towards comedy um, but I, I, I even the comedy I did a one man comedy show last year and it was very theatrical and, and actually quite tragic in the end and that was one of the reasons why many reviewers didn't quite get it 
tell me, um, what is your history, if you don't mind me asking, James? Because um, as a lover of musicals, it was very interesting to me that you haven't fallen into that mistake of basically saying everything in the dialogue and then having a song at the end that just repeats oh, it. Oh, well, I hate you, that. I, yeah, but don't I'm, you see it a lot? You do see it a lot, but I, that's one of the reasons I wrote a musical uh, was that I felt that I could do a lot better. Than, yes. And I'm not saying that this is the best I could, I could do because... For a start, it was written in a very short space of time, but by necessity, because I realised that Blair was going and I had to get this in the can. But um, I, I have been to a, a fair few musicals and just sat thinking, what, why is this a musical? What, why is this a musical? Yeah. Why, what's this song doing here? You know, for goodness sake, move the, the story on. I um, saw a very good comedy, Marred, because it pretended to be a musical only yesterday, and I'm not going to say who they are. Well, I'd, uh, it's kind of it's 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 a different type of musical. Maybe it's it's a, it's about style over substance and I, I'm really kind of although I, I hope that it's a stylish piece I really hope that it's substantial as well and, oh, I think um, it is. and I also I love writing lyrics I love packing kind of we, in fact we cut a whole load of dialogue because the director would just say look this is all in the song so why do we need the dialogue and uh, this is just quite right now tell me what are your musical loves if you don't mind me asking because you some of your songs you uh, you you put in a lot of lyrics. Uh, they're all completely audible. They're good diction. Yeah. They, they sit perfectly, um, but they're intense, and it is quite an intense experience. It feels like listening to uh, Sondheim with all the water evaporating. Well, I love Sondheim very, very much. Man. I think Sondheim's musicals are, are for me the pinnacle of the form. Um, but I really, I'm a, I'm a big opera lover, and particularly, I, th- I mean, I think that for me, opera has to be a dramatic form. So I kept very depressed by operas which, which fail to do that, so, which I think is, is quite a lot of them. So I'm less into Puccini and more into Britain. And, and really? obviously, where well, operas in my own language obviously appeal the most. I, I think that John Adams, for all that I don't much like his music, has written some, some, some very dramatic, very effective operas. The Death of Klinghoffer is, is a fantastic piece. So is opera more of a source for you, an inspiration, the musical, or is it well, a bit of everything? Well, you'll have noticed a lot of the musical is through composed. Mm, it is, and, indeed. And that is... I mean, that comes it comes back to this thing about what, why why use dialogue if you, if you can do it in the um, it, it, in, in the song, music yeah, because that's that's what it's all there for and and also I love the, the different levels you can do with music I mean this is where I think opera often scores heavily over musicals because musicals and I, I sometimes it's definitely an, an, an exception to this but a lot of musicals I've seen just kind of treat the song as a song it's, it's a pretty tune very much style of substance whereas I think that if the, if the music doesn't have some bearing on the words then, then what's it doing and I actually think that that's, there's the fun with Tony Blair is setting his sound bites to music and suggesting uh, setting his sound bites to a very kind of schmaltzy yes. uh, very uh, deliberately over the top balladry kind of it's, it's basically Bonnie Tyler but, <laughs> but with Tony Blair's words I, I, I love the, the, the layers you can give the, 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 the lyrics using that well, I thought your lyrics were quite masterful because you were able to use genuine quotations that he's made uh, and very known quotations. Not too many. I mean, the, the biggest laughs in the show are actually not mine at all. They're Tony Blair's. I <laughs> uh, yes. slightly resent him for that. Yes, but you've set him to music. You know, I know, yes. that's true. Any good comic would love that. Uh, <laughs> uh, that is essentially what he made, or a tragedy, uh, man of tragedy, possibly. Yes. I'm not sure. But um, to me, it was uh, very good that you were able to do it without shoehorning them in. It didn't feel laboured. It didn't feel... Um, for me, I, I thought natural rhythms of speech, and you were able to play with that in music. So it's very difficult to do. And I had two goes at the soundbite song, I, and the first one was was over a year ago when I when I was still playing with the idea and I hadn't really settled into anything. I had a go at writing the soundbite song, and it was a bit rubbish, really. So, but it's good to start so and then right. start again. Isn't yeah, it? definitely. So and many I, people just do a first draft. Well. But so I'm ashamed to say a lot of this is kind of the first draft. I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate yeah. enough to have an orchestrator, so I, I would kind of farm out the, orchest- the, 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 paper, the music as I was pretty much writing it, just by hand, and he'd turn it into something resembling a, a score. Well, every sometime these are Jonathan Tunick. Well, abs- <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I, certainly if they've only got eight months to write the show in. So you started in October, you said. I started in October because I came back from Edinburgh last year um, via Australia. Because I did really it. bad ticket buying, if you don't mind. I know, really, really inconvenient. Um, so I, I didn't hit ground in England again until the, the very end of September. Then I moved house, and by that stage, I'd re- the ideas had really started to come. But there was also a sense of panic because I know how early you have to get things rolling for the fringe, and you don't want to be apl- applying for a venue if you've only got a few songs written. You, I, kn- I wanted to know that there was a musical there. It's so, absolutely. So it, it was three months of really intense writing. And then, of course, the, the booking houses and booking venues and uh, sweet-talking uh, people for money took over. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and the musical often took a back seat. So how, how I managed to write a musical that lasts 90 minutes is actually quite uh, st- still uh, something I'm not quite sure. Well, I'm quite shocked that if you're saying 
glibly that you you know that you did it intensely, but you were concentrating on so many other things. And I have to say, I think you must have a great future. So to tie into that, what's your past? What is your future? My past is well, I um, I studied music at Cambridge University. I graduated five years ago. And I didn't much like the idea of a nine to five job mm. because I don't think my body works in that way. It doesn't <laughs> work at all before midday, actually. So uh, I went freelance, and that essentially means I've been unemployed for quite a lot of the last five years. But you know, I uh, I have done some really um, soul destroying temping jobs to support myself. I really kind of believed it was something to go for. Keep body and soul together. Absolutely, and I've been through. I, I am a writer, I'm a musician, I'm also an actor, and I've kind of juggled the three actually in pretty much even amounts. Uh, I guess it's the writing that's really taken off in a way because uh, I had a book published last year which is actually about the Edinburgh Fringe. Splendid. What's that called? It's Just called Fringe. It's the only book you'll find about the Fringe. So, Clues of a title there, I think. Yes. <laughs> Um, I have written various articles for, for people and I, also, I do quite a lot of teaching musically um, which is obviously a nice nice little learner and, and I enjoy it very much um, but it's given me the, the flexibility to say write a musical in less than a year where do you want to go next? where do I want to go? I'd love to do this uh, full time and I'd love to I'd love to be writing musicals and actually, you know, have someone backing them and, and mm-hmm. doing the doing the admin stuff. Because what I don't enjoy is producing shows, and I've ended up doing it almost by default because I know what I'm doing. You know, it's it's actually quicker to do it yourself than to just tell someone, kind of give them a list of things to do and keep checking up on them. Yes, or they come back to you. All the yeah, time. but to, but for someone to take over that side of things and let me just create and write, um, I think I would miss the stage a lot, and I th- I think I will keep coming back to that. I said I did a one man show at the Fringe last year which was a, a critical success, a, a commercial failure. I prefer it that way around, to be honest. And um, I've got other ideas for one-man shows. Certainly got other ideas for bits of theatre and musicals. I hope this won't be your last musical. Um, for our listeners, and we have listeners both in Britain and America, well, everywhere, but Britain and America principally, um, what's the website if they want to hear more about Tony Blair the Musical? Uh, TonyBlairTheMusical.co.uk and if you want to hear more about me, it's... it's uh, that was my next question. <laughs> it's jameslark.co.uk. I see the method you're using. Yes, it's very clever. I just take a name, I put .co.uk on the end of it. Well, I hope people will um, go to those websites. And where, where does Tony Blair the Musical go next? Tony Blair the Musical, uh, sadly, uh, after The Fringe, um, which was very much always intended to be a testing ground to see whether it worked. I'd like to say it does work. Um, we have one date after that in a lovely theatre called the Style Theatre, which is in Oundle, mm-hmm. near Peterborough. And after that, it's a matter of really searching for, for venues. We, we've, everyone who's been involved has been so positive about mm-hmm. it. Um, it's very encouraging when that happens. And it's also become clear that we can sell this show, at least for a little while longer. So um, I think we'll be looking at, if, if no one actually comes up to us and gives us wads of cash and says, you know, take this to America you have listeners in America don't you we do indeed they've got lots of money in America haven't they well (laughs) we'll do very well in America big American theatre that'd be wonderful but you know uh, (laughs) if if that doesn't happen then I think we'll be looking at London fringe theatres and looking for funding and I hope that it doesn't take too long to get that together but I hope that with the success of Edinburgh behind us it shouldn't be too difficult well I hope so too I have to say this is a show that feels to me that it should be on a national tour it should definitely come to London if you can't make the West End it should certainly be in the fringes I'd also like to do it because at the moment we're all crammed onto the tiniest stage in the world and sweating away uh, and, and eight people playing all the parts which and they're doing a phenomenal job and I think that's actually part of the fun of this production is watching every, you know, everyone is so integral to the machine um, but on the other hand it is quite uh, large scale in kind of concept and to do it with a big Les Miserables style chorus would be immensely good fun and also free up uh, I think the production in a lot of areas You'd have to start thinking about a different set though wouldn't you? You'd- Oh yeah, but I mean, you have to do everything very simply in Edinburgh, partly because we, you know, we knew we have a stage that's two metres uh, deep and five metres across. Well, I think that's a virtue, actually. I have to say because I didn't miss that at all. I thought the way you used what you had was perfect. And uh, may I also say, your Peter Snow is fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, James Cavers, more than one character in this. You're yes, on both sides I mean, of the Peter, political divide. With, with Peter Snow, I mean, for some of us, it's just like we're rushing or we're coming off, and it's like Gordon Brown's the only one I've really spent a lot of time. Um, Concentrate. work concentrating on it you, know, you picked Snow, up some of his facial of... mannerisms beautifully well, you got a laugh just on I that I did though, get a laugh yes. on the facial mannerism that went in two days ago and it's staying in yes well, James I have to say it's been fascinating talking to you thank you so much for giving me your time thank I know you very much no, it's been a pleasure on, but good luck for the future thank and, you very um, much do listeners please look at his websites because uh, the show is great and I would recommend everyone go and see it and you can buy the full cast recording of Tony Brown the Musical from uh, the Friday Project I'm going to do that so, <laughs> you know it's 66 minutes and 6 seconds long 
What does that is that you? a coincidence? Well, Tony, I, I believe I, I understand a few years ago there were some fundamentalists in America who had identified Tony Blair Tony as the Antichrist. The oh, well, there you go. It's proof. Yes, there we are. <laughs> for all those of you who think that Tony Blair is the devil. We're now fade out on the Twilight Zone music. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that was the fantastic James Lark, who's both a really nice fella and indeed an incredibly talented one. And let's just hear another of his songs. It's called The Terrorist Countermeasures Song. And the background that you need to know for this is that it's sung by David Blunkett, who was a former British Home Secretary secretary with a little bit of a reputation for being illiberal. When people talk about human rights, freedom of expression and the like, they think these rights are a principle, something they should have or go and strike. What they don't understand, that they understood and that they're right, is that human rights lead to chaos and disorder, breakdown of what ordinary people value most. Freedom of expression leads to theft, modern art, football hooligans, crime of every shape and every size, terrorism, reading Jeffrey Archer, being foreign, homosexuality, and so I think it's wise, though some people may say I'm a fascist kraut. Lock em up, lock em up, when in doubt Lock em up, lock em up, lock em up, lock em up To avoid a lengthy row, put them in the slammer now Lock em up, lock em up, lock em up, lock em up Because concept touch liberty and thinking that we're somehow free At best are all illusionary, my argument essentially is if We see people act suspiciously, lock em up and throw away the key Don't talk to me about evidence, airy-fairy civil liberties Sure, at their core, they're a valid chore Just like saying thanks and saying please But it's a time of war, we've got more acute priorities Can't afford to let terrorists through the net by using as a pretext their apparent innocence by security imprisonment without rights is the only way we can keep the terrorists at bay without telling them what they're accused of that way they won't know what to appeal against so none will get away because British justice tends to take a while Lock em up, lock em up, without trial Lock em up, lock em up, lock em up, lock em up To avoid a lengthy row, put them in the slammer now Lock em up, lock em up, lock em up, lock em up Because concept touches with liberty and thinking that we're somehow free At best are all illusionary, my argument essentially is if We see people act suspiciously, lock em up and throw away the key Well, that's a fantastically funny song, uh, although frightening as well, I think, from the Home Secretary, from Tony Blair the Musical. I have to say, one of the best things that I saw in the Edinburgh Fringe this year. I mean, in a nutshell, I'd have to say it was a sophisticated and searingly intelligent show by a fully formed musical talent. There are other Blair musicals out there, but this is the one to see, in my view. Um, Credit where it's due, James Lark uh, wrote it, um, but the director was Delith Jones, and the musical director and orchestrator was Christopher Mundy, both people uh, to watch out for, I think, as well as James. Um, Delith Jones has said that we knew from the beginning that we didn't want to obscure the observations and storyline that James Lark has formed, or chronicled, with impersonations. Our task is to create performances that capture the spirit of Tony Blair, Gordon Brown and the other figures that humanise them whilst we laugh at what they have done and failed to do over the past ten years. And it's true, the show isn't about impressions, it is about a relationship. Uh, I think that's uh, extremely good. And I have to say that so do other people. It's um, been nominated uh, for the Best Book Writer nominations at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival this year uh, by Musical Theatre Matters. And I do think that at heart it is a very sophisticated reading of the relationship between the Prime Minister at the time and the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time. That's Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. James himself has said... Uh, First off, we didn't at any stage want to take the easy route of mockery, poking fun at Blair simply because it's easy to ridicule any leader, especially one that's outstayed his welcome. But with Blair, we always felt it was important to take him seriously, to try to see the events through his eyes. And I think that's fair. It's it's, it's an accurate reading and a satirical reading, but it's not uh, a burlesque or a lampoon. It's much cleverer than that. Some of the cast are just simply wonderful. Uh, Nathan Kiley uh, is a very convincing Tony Blair. And I have to say I'm tremendously impressed by Anton Tweedale, who played both David Blunkett and George W. Bush. George W. Bush, of course, turning up somewhere in the musical, as you might expect about Tony Blair, and uh, actually being one of the fundamental reasons for the change in the relationship with Gordon Brown. Uh, if you like, turning Tony Blair's head for towards a bigger world picture um, overall I think the score is absolutely fantastic I will say I think there's one number which I don't like myself and that's the song about Michael Howard it's called the Michael Howard song and it generally suggests that Michael Howard wasn't electable because his face resembles a bottom um, it's quite funny uh, but actually I have to say of all the criticisms of the conservative leader at the time I don't think that his face was one of them but apart from that I think the rest of the show is just fantastic In absolute fairness to James, he's quite meticulous with his rhyming and his lyrics are a joy to hear, I have to say. So do go and buy the CD. It is available. I've been listening to it a lot. Uh, That's the website www.tonyblairthemusical.co.uk. James himself, in his interview, mentioned the soundbite song. So we'll just hear a little bit of that. Please, call me Tony. A 
A day like today is not a day for sound bites. But I feel the hand of history upon our shoulders. It has been a remarkable and historic victory. We will stand and show our values by our spirit and dignity. Power without principle is barren, but principle without power is futile. What the electorate gives, the electorate can take away. That's why it's not a day for sound bites, a day like today. I didn't come into politics to change the Labour Party. I came into politics to change the country. We've got 1,000 days to prepare for a thousand years. I can only go one way. been elected as new labor and will govern as new labor for this house to give a lead this is the time tough on crime tough on the causes of crime we are the servants we're here to serve we're here to give you Government you deserve. We are the people's party, the many, not the few. Today, enough of talking, it is now time to do. The art of leadership is saying no, not yes. We have 14 days to say. By the letter, no regretter. I'll make clear to everyone that things can only get better. Well, it's been very widely um, documented in the press, but there were two musicals about Tony Blair at the Edinburgh Fringe this year, and I was lucky enough to see both. Now, James Lark has quite rightly said to me um, that everyone has gone for comparison uh, and it's probably to the detriment of both shows they're trying to do slightly different things and it's certainly true that having seen both of them I wouldn't in any way genuinely say they were doing the same thing at all so I toddled along to hear Tony the Blair musical that's the second one that's Tony exclamation mark I should say and I was lucky enough to get interviews with the um, writer and director that's Chris Bush and the excellent actress who played uh, Cherie Blair and Princess Diana that's Ellie Cox. So we'll start with the creation of the piece. How, how did you um, come up with the idea and how, how did it develop? Uh, well, myself um, and the composer, Ian McCluskey, have been saying for ages that we were going to write a musical and basically just needed our idea. Um, and then over Christmas I was watching a lot of NAF musicals and there's some Evita and some Joseph and then I thought, yeah, Tony, he's an equally iconic figure. Um, he doesn't have a multicoloured coat though, I know, does he? Uh, uh, yeah. Shades of grey. Yeah, think. shades of grey, quite, yeah. And it's occasional flashes of red, but yeah. So how long did it take to write? Um, the initial draft came together very quickly. Um, we got, well, I got the, um, an initial script or certainly a few lyrics together in a week or so. Uh, and then we had some tunes down by the end of a fortnight. And then for the next kind of three months or so following, we were refining and finishing everything off. But um, we worked quite quickly together. And when did you join the project? Uh, I've been I've been friends with Chris and the composer Ian for quite a while, and they've just um, asked me to um, sing a few songs, see how it sounded, and they offered me the part soon after. So, and been... Diana's quite a, an iconic role. Um, yeah. were, you, were you worried that perhaps uh, it, it, both you as actor, actress, and uh, you as writer might 
might find that the one or two jokes about uh, her might not go down well. I thought yeah. they went down well tonight. <laughs> I, I was worried at first, you know, as to how the audience would react to them because it is, you know, there are a couple of jokes that do kind of just about hit the line, maybe not go quite over it, but it's, you know, it's touch and go. But I think it does seem to be going down well. People realise that we're doing it in a light-hearted manner. It's not too too serious. And also time has passed, has it not, I think, on, on both those issues? Or, yeah. You'd hope so, yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, there was one horrible moment when we thought, are we actually going to be performing on the 10th anniversary oh, yes. of Dines, which would be slightly bad taste, potentially. But um, I think we can get away with it. I mean, it's irreverent, but I don't think it's offensive. You know, it's all fairly affectionate, so. And um, it's, re- it's a review in many ways, isn't it? Um, it feels like that, to yeah, me. Yeah, I mean, I think so, definitely, when you've got Tony as the um, narrator figure. It's as much a kind of satire of musical theatre um, as it is a satire of politics. So um, it's all, There's a sense of sketches developing in it. Uh, do, do, you, do you get that feel? As, uh... Definitely. I mean, you get one song that recurs, you know, with, yes. as more, you know, the people become more and more kind of isolated and rejected from Tony's inner circle. You know, you get the same tune coming back again, so definitely that kind of feel. And there is that sense, is there not almost, that it's, um, you're going for the emotional connections that Tony Blair does or doesn't have, almost the soap opera aspects rather than re- real politics. Politics rears its head occasionally, but... Yeah, I think it does. I mean, I didn't want it to be a piece of agitprop and I didn't want to, you know, kind of nail my own political ideology to the mast and say, kind of, this is what I believe and Tony Blair's evil and whatever, because I don't think that this is really the place for that. I mean, if someone wants to do that, then fine, but that's not the show that I wanted to write. Um, this was all about the entertainment and I think there is politics there but it's kind of it's hidden within this kind of glossy um, exterior it's which I think does it favors. social relationships isn't it than the actual politics and um, are you pleased with the reception you've had because it was it looked sold out to me tonight we've been astounded by it I mean this is the ninth night in a row that we've sold out I think so ninth far, night so. yeah basically I mean we had a couple of nights at the beginning and a previous basically since then we've been selling out um, Every day, so it's fantastic, really. It's More above than we and beyond. Imagined, yeah. yeah, it's been brilliant. And did I hear you say earlier that you were from York University? That's right, yeah. And what well, are you studying there, if you don't mind me saying? Well, I've just um, graduated um, uh, in a degree with English writing and performance. Ah. Um, so this is kind of what I want to do, but um, the cast is quite a hodgepodge, really. Yeah, yeah. I've just graduated from psychology, so. Uh, you're I mean, the hodgepodge, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you could say that it's related, but no, I mean, the drama's <laughs> just a, more of a pastime, so. Oh, splendid. Well, if you don't mind me saying it, it all looked very professional, very jaunty as well. I mean, it was a great sense of fun in it, I thought. Yeah. I think the audience latched onto that. Yeah, I hope so. That's what we were going for. It was an interesting age group of the audience as well. On the whole, generally middle-aged, but some children. Yeah. We have been trying to say that when we've been, um, you know, going around flyering on the mile. Yeah. And, you know, people say, is it a, a family show? I think it is, it's really. You, know, it's, you don't yeah. have to know too much about the politics to understand. Oh, no. so. yeah. And the, the, um, the costumes are quite easy to do, aren't they? <laughs> Except for the, the occasional angel wings. Yeah, yeah which is that, nice. Suits yeah. and ties, quite easy. Well, yeah, you know, keep it simple. Um, yeah. But uh, um, nice, a uh, good band, I thought. I mean, there was a sense. Of... Amazing band, yeah. yeah. We're really lucky to kind of, yeah, find the people who again came together right at the last minute. We spent quite a long time looking for a guitarist, and Chris is just incredible. Um, so he blew us all away. So, where'd you go from here? Well, he was a writer first. Um, well, I mean, this is what I want to do. I mean, me and Ian have already said we're going to write another musical at some point. That's kind of in the pipeline. I mean, this is my first musical, but I've been working or kind of trying to establish myself as a more serious yeah. um, playwright for a while, and that's what I want to do. Hopefully, there might be life in Tony yet. Um, <laughs> we're very up, you know, for, for moving on um, to bigger and better things. You um, don't think Knees Up Golden Brown might be the thing for you then? I'm not sure. We'll have to wait and see. See if he gets a little bit more funky, you know, whether you can get a musical out of him. And, and what, what's your future? Is it performing or...? Uh, we'll see. No plans as yet, but, but really we'll, should we'll be. see if there are any offers in the pipeline. <laughs> now, I'd like to say I really enjoyed the show, so thank you both very much for talking thank to me. I'm extremely much. grateful and best of luck to you both. Thank you very thank much. You. And that was a very entertaining interview. I also met Jethro Compton, who was uh, very splendid as Peter Mandelson. Probably ought to mention the composer, that's Ian McCluskey. Uh, and James Duckworth, also uh, an excellent Tony Blair, playing him quite differently to uh, Nathan Kiley from Tony Blair the Musical, but uh, quite entertaining. Now, overall, I enjoyed it. Um, it was a different feel entirely. In my view, it's more of a review than a musical. Uh, it doesn't. It, it, it was more a series of sketches, and it certainly, certainly um, was less satirical. It was much less sophisticated about understanding the relationship between Gordon Brown and Tony Blair. Um, and I have to be honest, um, there was a, it, it's described itself as irreverent but not offensive. Uh, but there were a couple of mentions of the word poof, which in this day and age strikes me as a little bit uh, unusual. Uh, they were used in a negative way by characters against uh, Peter Mandelson, uh, who was a cabinet member, um, 
Now, history relates that Peter Madison left the cabinet twice, but on neither occasions was it due to his sexuality. It was slightly odd and felt a little bit uncomfortable, that particular use of the line. Um, yet conversely, and I was very surprised about this, uh, Princess Diana comes back as an angel and starts giving advice to Tony Blair. And when she first turns up, um, bearing in mind she's dead, Tony Blair to her and says, uh, did you have trouble getting here tonight? Uh, the traffic's murder tonight, which is a very um, difficult joke given her demise, but um, they've got a laugh. So I think there's a tide of public opinion has turned on the sanctity of Princess Diana. So I have to say it was a very funny musical, less clever, but very funny. Uh, Tony Blair's character says, well, in the past, my friends were people I actually liked. Um, there's some interesting lyrics. Uh, George Bush, again um, portrayed, of course, um, sings, I wasn't lonely because you're my Tony. I didn't have a care because you're my Mr. Blair. But it's more about the social relationships and not about the politics. There's one recurring theme. It's called There's No I in Team and There's No Me in Tony. And as each of the characters feel less connected with Tony, as they feel that he's betrayed them, they all sing a variant on that theme, and that's quite an interesting development. Um, the one area where I think it really um, succeeds over Tony Blair, the musical, funnily enough, is in the um, approach towards the Conservatives. I didn't much like the Michael Howard song, but I did like the, to- uh, the Tory quartet, uh, which appeared in Tony, the Blair musical, which has four Conservative leaders, John Major, William Haig, uh, the other one, and Michael Howard. And indeed, he's referred to as the other one because he's generally considered not to be very memorable. That's Ian Duncan Smith for those people who don't actually remember. And they sing it as a barbershop quartet, and it's very funny indeed. Um, It's interesting that both musicals feel the need um, to mention the Conservatives, but of course the Conservatives were in such disarray during the ten years um, that they're not really an important part of the development of the politics and the events that were occurring over those ten years, so they are a little bit tokenistic. Different endings in both the musicals. Tony Blair the musical um had tony blair sort of assassinated in the style of julius caesar quite interestingly um whereas in tony the blair musical tony is redeemed or at least his self-worth is redeemed uh, through a child which was quite interesting and both musicals very good indeed but i have to say overall i think tony blair the musical is the better option and i enjoyed it very much Well, I didn't just see musicals, I also saw a couple of cabarets while I was in Edinburgh. Two particularly good ones were um, Ella, Marilyn, Marlena and me, um, where a very talented young Australian lady by the name of Melissa Weston gives this interesting, well, it's an interesting uh, uh, hour, really, I should say. The story which she has chosen um, on which to hang the songs that she decides to sing in the end uh, comes about her grandmother giving her an enchanted hairbrush found in the lavatories of the Carnegie Hall. And by uh, brushing her hair with it, her heroine uh, can sing in the style of famous divas. And she chooses Ella Fitzgerald, Marilyn Monroe and Marlena Dietrich. Um, She only sings five songs over the whole show, Mac the Knife, Falling in Love Again, After You Get What You Want, You Don't Want It, uh, those three in the style of the divas that she's chosen, and then the last two, Where Does It Start and That's Life, in her own style. I have to say she's, um, she's a very spunky young lady, uh, very funny, and uh, she says at one stage, um, success is 90% perspiration, 9% flirtation, and 1% inspiration. It was very good, very entertaining. That's Ella, Marilyn, Marlena and me, and in no way made the worst for the fact I saw it in a really grotty vault. And I say vault um, rather, well, vault perhaps overplays it, more of a hole under a building. Anyway, another uh, cabaret I saw, which was just brilliant, was called Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea, and it was the winner of the Scotsman Fringe First Award. It very much feels like a, a mixture of Edward Gorey and Tim Burton's animated films. The company that ran it was called 1927, and they played it... Um, as though it were a kind of Weimar Republic cabaret, um, but done with lots of interactive um, projections. A brilliant um, conceit it was. Um, I'll give you an example. A young lady comes on, in, stands in front of a big screen, but she's holding a small screen up to waist height in front of her. Onto the half screen is projected a lady's legs running, uh, and she's standing there not running um, above it. Very entertaining. All, for example, uh, all for some reason in 1920s bloomers. How would I describe it? I think I describe it as sinister and evocative clever and haunting and unique and that's cabaret but that wasn't the only bizarre but slightly sinister thing um, to be seen I went to see a fantastic musical called Famished the musical Um, it's been nominated in the categories of best new musical and best musical lyrics in the 2007 Edinburgh Fringe Festival Um, and it's set within the rotting bowels of Victorian London follows and i'm quoting here from the blurb our tale follows exquisitely mustachioed evil genii dr corvus and mr gray and their unending pursuit of fine brandy finer cigars and total world domination 
A task may prove more difficult, however, considering gallant explorer Henry Forbes has mistakenly brought home a deadly cargo of ill-mannered, ravenous zombies from the jungles of Borneo. All in the cherished heart of a civilised empire could be lost. From beautiful and financially desirable Amelia, to her parents, the distinguished Colonel Lady Avery, to grubby whore Annie, to ranting loon Sila, and all other kinds of insignificant women, children and poor people. Against a foe as considerable as this, only one solution remains for the dashing Mr Gray and maniacal deviant Dr Corvus, the unleashing of something more terrifying and powerful than London could ever possibly imagine. And it has to be said that Dr Corvus and Mr Gray were just fantastic, deserving a whole series of musicals in my view. It's very bizarre musical, it's a lovely quotation about the badgers are fleeing from London. And when Annie, the um, prostitute, does come on, she just wanders on in a kind of dazed look, turns to the audience and shouts, fresh whore! Um, there's some intelligent lyrics, uh, um, as a, a, there's one uh, quotation which is why can't the English teach the empire how to kneel which of course is deliberately designed to um, evoke the song why can't the English teach their children how to speak from My Fair Lady um, the score itself wasn't integrated um, but it was very tuneful um, and all in all it was a jolly good laugh it was a good funny comedy and I was lucky enough to interview Jake Morley the composer, the musical director and indeed the live pianist for the um, performance of that evening how did, how did the project start? Um, I was uh, approached by an old uh, colleague and friend of mine called Alex Genbash, uh, who um, uh, was is the uh, right, co-writer and director. He wrote the script with um, his cousin Lex Gen, and um, yeah, they they just basically wanted to um, have an excuse to go to Edinburgh, write a great show, have a great time, um, write a really enjoyable show, and. Um, yeah, its preliminary title was, was "Zombies!" Exclamation mark on ice! Exclamation mark. Ah. Um, but um, yeah, they, they changed to famished. Ice is quite hard to do here in Edinburgh. Well, exactly. We, we never really intended ice. I think it was just uh, <laughs> a great note. Yeah. I mean, it is infused with fun all the way through. That's the, very much the feeling I got. Well, exactly. That was that was what we were aiming for. We, we just wanted to um, have something hilariously funny all the way through that didn't. I mean, we weren't exactly tackling important social issues uh, or anything like that. We well, were. Zombie menace is under, it's underestimated. <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, um, we did a lot of uh, lot of our research yes. in uh, old zombie films and uh, and all the many, many classic uh, Victorian zombie comedy musicals of the past. How uh, long did it take to develop the project from the very beginning to here? Um, the script was finished in around about January of 2007. Uh, I started the music in sort of Feb. I, well, wrote it during February, March time, um, and yeah. Since then, we've just been uh, trying to assemble a cast, a sensational cast. I'm really thrilled with um, to have them on board. Some incredible talents. I uh, wouldn't want yeah, anyone else to uh, perform the show, really. Huge comic talent, if I may say. Very much so. Particularly um, your principal two villains, if oh, I may say, who, yes, who steal uh, every scene. Oh, they are sensational, aren't they? I mean, I can't say en- em- enough good words about them. They're a real find. I mean, uh, and their names, just for the record? Um, we've got a character called Dr. Corvus, who's played by uh, a sensational actor called Will Allen. Uh, and his sort of partner in genius crime is uh, uh, Mr. Grey, who's played by uh, Ray- Ryan Beange. And certainly as an audience member, I, I, I couldn't take my eyes off them. I, they, every scene they were in sort of came to life because they have a crackling personality together. Yeah. Plus also, madness bounces out of them. <laughs> yeah, they're definitely very energetic performers, um, very charismatic, amazing characters. Um, beautiful, one case, beautiful slow timing for the Doctor. Where he kisses the Colonel on the chin, <laughs> and it's the most delicate, <laughs> light, and yet hilarious moment. Well, yeah, the, the two characters are kind of... Um, uh, very different in many ways. Dr. Corvus is very exceptionally intelligent, but very socially, in some ways, clueless and inept. Um, what, what, Mr. Gray is much more charming and debonair, but um, doesn't share Corvus's maniacal genius, I suppose. And indeed, for a while, at least gets the heroin. Oh, uh, indeed, for yes. A while. Well, yeah, fickle heroin. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, uh, that's Izzy Harris, who um, uh, plays Amelia Avery. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's interesting. There, you kind of, kind of, kind of focusing on them as the love interest, but. Um, uh, as the youngsters and as the beautiful young people, but um, I quite like the way that the real love story is played out by uh, Amelia's parents, Lady, Lady and Avery, and her, her, her husband, the Colonel. Indeed, they have a sincere love song um, they do. towards the end, don't they? Which is quite unusual because the whole thing has been so so comically bouncy, as I say. <laughs> well, I find they, yeah, they I, have this sincere moment. I find the um, their song incredibly comic as well, just because it, in, its, in a different context, it might just seem like a fairly straightforward love song, but. Uh, within the context of so much other comedy yes. songs that uh, the fact that it is so straight I think is where the comedy is derived from. And they, they do it so beautifully buttoned up. 
Oh, doubt very much so, yeah. Well, very rep- repressed Victorian characters in many ways. Now, obviously you were playing the piano live during the performance. Yeah. Uh, how did you find that? Because you have to vamp a bit as well, don't you? <laughs> well, z- zombify, I think, is yeah, the Yeah, well, uh, that's much better, yes. Yeah, technical sort of different, term. Different, different, <laughs> different kind of better, yes. <laughs> um, I love it. It's a really, uh, a part I really love, um, part of my role that I really relish. Because, and indeed um, you dress up for it, if I'm I do, yes. well, I mean, it would, look, it, would, it, would, it would look a bit... Uh, in some ways, kind of uh, not necessarily eye-catching in the right ways if, uh, if I was not in uh, costume like everyone else. And um, so how do you go about composing? You know, what tone do you set for this? When you, when you saw this on the paper and you thought, how am I going to, you know, how am I going to write the music for this? I mean, what went through your mind well, we, creatively? We had some meetings. I had, had a, you know, I met with, met with uh, Alex Genbash and Lex Gen, the, the two writers, and we just had a rough outline of what we wanted those songs to do. Um, I don't like to think about it too much. I, I'd, rather, I'd, I'd rather just sort of sit down there and... Um, I know it's such a yeah. tiny cliche, but I mean, you know, you just, at the end of the day, you've got to sit down and do it. And, and so, um, so yeah, I really enjoyed that, that, that section of it. And, does yeah. the show have a website? It does indeed. It's um, Our listeners will be interested. Why don't you tell us what it I is? I'd love to. Okay, it's www.famishedthemusical.com. And where do you hope it will go after Edinburgh? Um, we are keen to sort of um, to carry it on. It's, it's a project that we've, we so enjoyed to perform. Yeah. Hopefully it is highly enjoyable to watch. Oh, I thought so, um, yes. We've been doing exceptionally well in Edinburgh, selling out basically every night. And it did sell so, out, which is not true of every show, is it? Well, minutes? yeah, I mean, certainly in Edinburgh, we, this is our first also ever show we've ever written or taken up anywhere. Splendid. So um, we were kind of very unsure of, sort of what exactly might happen, and uh, we've been really thrilled with, with the way that it's, it's our first effort and it's selling out, and we're, you know, could be more pleased with it. Where can you go from here? Quite. Well, exactly. I mean, uh, well, we have sequels, do you think, by the way? Cause I, do, <laughs> I, do, I do think the villains have got much life in them yet, you know. They, really? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they could run to their own sitcom. I think they might do. Yeah, I mean, um, I, yeah, I, we'll see where it goes. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly interested, and we're talking to some promoters who are interested in taking uh, the show elsewhere around around UK. Um, but we'll see. You know, my, Alex Alex uh, Gembash is very keen to turn it into a film, but well, um, <laughs> yeah. we can dream. Well, once he's been on tour, I'm sure that'll happen. All musicals turn into films eventually. Now. Well, yeah, yeah. And, w- and you personally, w- w- what's your ambition? Is it in musical theatre to continue? Uh, well, uh, as I said, this is the first time I've ever written a musical, so um, I'm still kind of. Uh, I kind of like to do a whole range of things. I do bits of tuition and write music for other things. So it's kind of, um, uh, you know, it's been an incredible experience. Whether I'll actually, you know, go on to write thousands more musicals is, uh, is we'll have to wait and see, I suppose. But even two's a career, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it is, then I, I better get pending another yeah. one then. Well, I, I have to say, it was a very enjoyable show. And thank you so much for taking a few minutes to speak to me. So I'm very grateful. Not at all, thanks. Um, thank you very much indeed. Thank Jake Morley there. However, not all the musicals I saw were fantastic. I did have another disappointment, um, and I was lured into it by a, a rather interesting title, uh, which was Xenu is Loose! Exclamation mark. Cower, puny humans, as the Dark Prince of the Galactic Federation rains atomic death once more upon your pitiful planet. The musical! Exclamation mark. So there's two exclamation marks in that. Nice long title. Sadly, not a tremendously good musical. Its heart was in the right place, I think. It was attempting to be a rock opera. It was too loud to really hear the lyrics very well, and it was very disjointed. Um, some of it set in the uh, massive past, uh, and some of it set in the present day. Um, the scenes were too long, and they were very poorly paced. It wasn't nearly funny enough, and people thought for a while that it was a genuine musical about Scientology, and a lot of people left. Um, it used some um, film projection quite effectively. Indeed, um, <laughs> a man in a full rubber bodysuit, who plays the principal villain, that's Xenu, um, is projected onto the screen and it's a filmed video insert of him crossing the road into the venue in which the um, show was being performed and shooting someone in the foyer of the building we just passed through. So obviously it had been filmed right at the beginning of the festival. Um, so it was quite impressive. Um, unusually, once again, um, a rather unfortunate use of the word faggot in a derogatory sense for homosexuals um, ruined it again for me. But I think, to be honest, it was soiled and corrupted before I had a chance to enjoy it. It found its mark only in the last 10 minutes, really, when it realised it was a comedy. But until that point, I don't think it really knew what it was doing. However, from there, I was able to get away very quickly uh, and go and see, I think, the best show of the Fred's of all that I saw. Um, it was Iron Curtain. Uh, by Susan DeLallo, Peter Mills and Stephen Weiner. It was funny, clever and sincere and it was a show, a great show deserving of a West End production. I really enjoyed it. it. It's a 1950s era musical comedy and it really feels like it has come out of the 1950s. A pair of uh, Broadway songwriters who were not very good have come up with this uh, idea for a musical um, combining Faust 
with American football and they called it Faust Ball but of course they've been picked to the post because someone's just come up with damn Yankees so they don't get the gig and um, they're depressed and then they're kidnapped by the KGB because they wanted to inject some Yankee pizzazz into the USSR propaganda musical for the Ministry of Musical Persuasion and they come up rather splendidly with damnable Yankees which of course is just their Faust Ball rewritten for the Russians I have to say it's uh, it's a just a brilliant musical it felt like i was watching a professional west end production great dialogue americans won't come to russia they prefer to die of natural causes and when you're dealing with the kgb bkg people were rolling in the aisles not just their heads as usual some interesting lyrics take a boring manifesto and take a tune and presto Um, and it had a live orchestra which was lovely i was lucky enough to get talking to an actor and a director uh, from another show who'd come to see it His name's Matthew Everhart, and here's what he had to say about Iron Curtain, and also Sweeney Todd, which was playing here in Edinburgh. Uh, My name's Matthew. I'm in Edinburgh at the moment doing a production of Dracula, which is on at Sea Central, which is going very well. And you're in Um, that, aren't you? Yes, I am. Yeah, I play a doctor. So, uh, yes, it's it's going very well. So I'm very pleased with that. So, yeah. And um, now, what made you come and see Iron Curtain, first of all? Um, a friend of mine, actually, um, who's uh, actually in Out of the Blue, which is a vocal harmony group, and I, I trust his opinion because he mm. liked it. So if, if he said it was good, I was sure to uh, come along. And it was very good and really enjoyed it, yeah. It was indeed. Now, um, just to explain it to our listeners, it was a kind of 50s musical, but yeah. um, straddling both Broadway and really, um, well, Moscow and Ber- East Berlin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it was um, it was made very clear where you were by those those lights at the back that indicated the flags. It's small amount countries. of projection. Yes, and was very uh, well used as well. I think again with the lighting for what they have and the time they set the, these things up, uh, they did a really really good job, and they it was did. very clear. And uh, what did you think about the the music and lyrics? Yeah, I thought they were, they were very well written. Um, it, there weren't many, uh, there were quite a lot of solo numbers um, in comparison to kind of chorus numbers. And I think that's always very hard to pull off when you've got a lot of those solo numbers and to not let the pace drag. Uh, but the whole thing flowed really well and it was uh, really enjoyable to watch. I thought the lyrics in particular were extremely clever. There was a song called Missing, uh, where they played on the several different meanings yeah. of Missing. Um, I, the, the heroine would say, oh, the man I'm after... Um, has all the flair of Cary Grant and uh, Fred Astaire missing. Yeah, uh, but yeah. then at the end she confesses that actually... He is he's, actually missing. He's yeah, the, yeah. And, and he's the man that she's missing. Yeah, yeah. So that was... Very, I, and, and the songs did project the plot further, which isn't always the case. No, definitely, yeah. No, they're, they're very well written, actually. And um, Did you think it was funny? Yes, I, I did think it was funny. Um, I, I think it was... Um, uh, the, the whole concept was funny I think that was what was great about it it wasn't if there were small there were lots of quirky moments but the whole thing was the whole idea was a very good and quirky idea so I think that's what gave it a lot of its humour So, and that idea essentially was that um, two failed American songwriters um, were more or less kidnapped and taken to Russia to improve and indeed rewrite a, a, a Broadway style show for well Khrushchev actually yeah <laughs> Which I'm sure um, any any listener would agree was um, not entirely the most regular thing that would happen. <laughs> no, sure. Um, p- any performances stand out for you? Um, they were all very good. I think they were all really, really, as say, we can see that they've, they've been training and um, working hard on it. Um, really, I think everyone was at a very good level. And I think people, especially when they go to these schools, they're certainly taught to, to you know, show what they have. Everyone yes. has their own particular kind of skill. They can do something very well. Um, and, and they... And they certainly show that when they perform, and yeah, it was very, very impressive. Very good characters that they created. So, so and would you recommend it to someone else? Oh yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So would definitely. I, in fact. Okay, good. Yeah. Now you've you've been well. You're not just um, appearing in the Edinburgh Fringe, which is impressive enough, but you've uh, been to see a few other shows as well. Yeah, so. I went to see um, Sweeney Todd, um, which is another church from Cambridge, which was where I'm um, going to university. So, um, which was very, very good. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, they, uh, uh, the, yeah, it was very good. It was. Um, I saw with the recent production which toured around which was very successful uh, which is that's very much stuck in my mind of a great way to do Sweeney Todd the musical but uh, I thought it was a really really good job here and um, again v- very good um, characterisation comparatively with the, the travelling version which you see the touring version yeah. what would you say the principal differences were? Um, it was it's, it's a kind of a use of a chorus actually and productions I've seen is they kind of focus on the main characters in Sweeney mm. Todd and, and they don't feel the need to, to actually show much of a chorus but um, the production that I saw here in Edinburgh uh, really did use the chorus really effectively um, to to create London the actual city as opposed to just the characters and that, that specific story so the, kind of the environment was created as well um, 
Yeah, and there was a, a, got a lot of humour in it as well that perhaps I hadn't seen before. Um, for example, when Sweeney Todd is one by one knocking the, you know, yes. um, slitting those people's throats, and uh, there's a great moment in the production here where they uh, they'd, he'd put them on the chair, he'd cut their throats, turn the chair around, and they'd just slide off it off the back of it, and it happened three or four times. So, so there was a sense of humour with it, which I thought Quite was a dark uh, humour though. Perhaps, oh, yeah. black black comedy, <laughs> yes, but it was uh, humour human nonetheless. Yeah. Live orchestra? Um, yes, I think it might have just been a piano. Oh. I'm not entirely sure, but. Um, I can't remember hearing much many other instruments, but yes, yeah, so, but that worked very well. It worked so well for the venue that it was there, so you could hear them very clearly because they weren't mic'd or anything. So, uh, but that, that seemed to work very well. Yeah. And indeed, Iron Curtain, which we just seen, also had a small orchestra, of five yes. people or so. Yeah, and I think again that that worked very well. Yeah. Um, so you've seen Sweeney Todd. Now tell us a little bit about Dracula. It's not a musical, but um, no. I, I think it's only fair to hear what you're doing. OK, fair enough. Um, so yeah, we've, we've stuck quite closely to the novel by Bram Stoker. Um, and uh, it's a devised piece, so the whole company's come up um, with, the, with the way that we've decided to do it. Um, it it's kind of quite hard to... to uh, uh, to, to kind of put what category it is it's, it's in some ways there are some funny moments um, some very very gory moments where one point where someone passes Dracula passes blood from his mm. mouth into the mouth of someone else and it falls through midair it's very very oh, right. gruesome someone fainted from the blood on one night um, not the actress I mean. not the actress <laughs> no it was an audience member which was which is lucky really um, but yeah so it's a, a complete mix of different styles but on the whole I think it's just uh, very entertaining and I think if, if people come looking for you know something that's going to tell the story and that's going to be entertaining to watch, then hopefully they will enjoy what they see. And what does the future hold for you, Matthew? Um, well, I'm at Cambridge University, as I said, so I've got two more years still to go there. Um, then after that, who knows? Uh, kind of see what happens, really. Um, and while I'm at Cambridge, I'll certainly get involved as much theatre as I can. So, yeah. And indeed, I believe you're about to direct a musical yourself. Yes, um, I'm directing Fame next term, um, which is uh, scary, uh, but exciting nonetheless. Um, so I'm kind of still in the planning stages of that, um, looking at set and, and simple things like that. Um, but yeah, I suppose with the main one of the problems I'm trying to overcome with that, I mean, Fame is a great musical, but um, I think you've really got to try and bring out the story. I, I, I think it, it relies on more than just the songs, otherwise it's just one number after the other. And it has got, you know, quite a gripping story in it, so I think we've tried and, and quite a real story. Um, so if you try and bring that as much as you can to the surface and make it as almost as realistic as possible. And, so it's uh, a case of bringing out the emotion and letting then the songs display that emotion after yes. you've it out in the story. Anyway. Yes, definitely, yes. And, and not kind of, you know, uh, uh, the spectacle is obviously very important, but I think there's so much there where you can really, you know, get scripts of the characters and, and uh, get actors to say lines in the most truthful way that they can. So uh, remove some of the glitz and glamour around the sides and just tr try and say the lines, you know, as the thoughts are appearing in people's heads. Um, and then add the songs just to pad the whole thing out around the outside. And it, yeah. It's probably an unfair question, bearing in mind you're coming up to that. But what, you, what are the first things you're thinking about? You're talking about bringing up the story, but what have you got in your head, choreography? Um, yeah, I mean, a kind of a mixing, a sort of choreography, a mixing of dance styles that kind of has the um, kind of the ballet, um, which kind of um, some, you know, there's a, I think it's Iris who's the classically trained ballet dancer, and you've got Tyrone who's the kind of, you know, he's learned what he does on the street, and the way these two styles can kind of mix and work together. And certainly there are some shows at the Fringe that I'm hopefully going to go and see, um, which they do, they kind of. Um, so there's one show I can't remember what it's called but they started with a, a ballet dancer just at a bar doing whatever they do and then suddenly there's these when street dancers you mean a ballet bar oh a ballet bar yes not a ballet bar yes no a ballet bar so she, they're doing kind of very classical ballet and then they kind of have some street dancers come in and the whole thing kind of works together and builds to this kind of uh, wonderful climax and, and the two styles mix so I think yeah the mixing of styles really and certainly an exploration of different styles throughout the production there's a bit of kind of Spanish Latin in there there's a there's also kind of the 80s pop um, so, so yeah just really looking at the different styles and trying to bring that to the surface. Uh, forgive me, you're a young man, so how does 80s pop appear to you? Um, good fun. It seems pretty good <laughs> There's fun. There's no yeah. wrong or right answer to this. No, it, it all looks great. It all seems you know, pretty pretty exciting. No, it, it should be exciting territory. So, uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Well, best of luck with that. Well, and, thank you very uh, much. I hope you'll stay in contact so that we can uh, talk about fame again as it develops for you, <laughs> uh, both uh, as, as the musical, but also hopefully in your life. <laughs> great. Thank you very much. Matthew, thank you very much. As you know, the Edinburgh Fringe has a vast array of different kind of things on, um, not just different genres, but even in the field of musicals, there is a whole range of possibilities. And uh, I've seen two uh, with a good friend of mine by the name of John Brenner, and he's here to help discuss with me. Uh, he's waving at you, listeners. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, we're here to discuss two musicals. The first is called Sex, Lies and Hazard Tape. And sex is S-E-C-S -S there because it represents secretaries. It's a, um office-based musical. Now... 
John, you're not a huge fan of musicals in some ways. What, what did you make of this? It was inventive, uh, a bit, just a bit different from the other musicals that you've dragged me to over the weekend. <laughs> inventive use of characters, uh, three actors playing five characters, um, some quick changeovers, some use of film to do scenes that they couldn't do in terms of the ch- um, changeovers. The staging was moderate, I'd say, um, partially restricted by the venue. And yeah, it was good fun. Good jokes, well told. Songs had some original lines in, the songs fitted into the into the whole kind of tenor of the piece and moving move the plot forward, um, which can't just say about all the musicals we've seen this weekend. I thought it was strangely sort of... It, uh, it was nicely low-key. It was unambitious as far as I was concerned and succeeded very well at that level. If it had tried to be more... And I used the word in speech marks, professional, um, it wouldn't have hit the spot. But for me, I found it very funny. It had a very abrupt ending, I thought. Yes, it did. <laughs> I think probably restricted, obviously, all these shows fitting into an hour, hour and ten minutes on the fringe. Seem, they seem to have had trouble editing it down. Its ending worked better than some. Now, the thing about Sex, Lies and Hazardtape, it is, it's described as an office musical. It's um, a comedy in office politics. It's certainly a comedy. Uh, there was a great deal of laughter in it. And it was written by the two principal um, actresses in it, uh, Rosalind Neuer and Emma Jane Sweeney. They make up two-thirds of the cast and four-fifths of the characters, is what Indeed, I'm trying yes. to say. There were lots of changes. Now, as you, you pointed out quite rightly, John, that there was a projected videotape. It wasn't just slides or change of background. It was actually, uh, they went off stage to make one of their quick change costume changes yeah. and then we cut to a filmed insert in a stationary cupboard where someone gets um, made pregnant shall we say yeah. through means traditional um, and there were other inserts as well there was a rather over the top very funny I thought advertisement for waste management products Indeed, I mean, I think um, I think the records will show that I find it less funny than yourself <laughs> um, in that particular advert. Uh, I thought that was overdone. I thought it was very good using videotape. We've, nearly everything on the scene this, on the um, fringe scene this year seems to be using projection of some kind. And I thought this was, if not the most professionally done, certainly the most originally done. I think there's something to be said between the difference between f- professionalism, I think, of the recording mm. and the professionalism of the projection, because I'm afraid that age-old horror of the power off button, which appears on, as a dialogue box on anybody's computer appearing on the projection screen yes i think so although i, I think they were training up a new technical thing because he had, seemed to have trouble finding the house lights at the end of the show <laughs> it was a nice simple set as you pointed out i think um it was a, a, a small stage as so many of the venues here in edinburgh are um there was uh, the two desks uh, three chairs a projection screen behind and just a few props like a bottle of party wine called um totally rubbish wine the company being called totally rubbish you understand and it starts off at the end of um, a, a 2006 office party where indeed the uh, a senior management is found lying drunk on the floor with Terry the handyman, who's the IT hunk, who um, all the women at some stage either fancy or indeed sleep with, it seems. Um, not a great role for Terry. He didn't have much to do except to roll on occasionally, look a little bit handsome, press a few buttons and walk off again whilst being drooled over. Yes, but if formally ma- acting out the same thing, that may be a great role, I don't <laughs> know. Uh, um, yeah, he, he was a very much a bit part um, but, you know, played it adequately. I didn't actually realise that uh, Emma Jane Sweeney, who plays both Susan and Linda, uh, um, was doing so. And in fact, you, there's a hierarchy here because um, there are, as I say, five characters, four of which were female. Tina and Susan were, if you like, telesales assistants, and they were the lower level. And then you had Linda and Jackie, who were the fighting middle managers, with Terry the IT hunk, as he's described, coming in in, in the middle of this play, eventually making nearly everybody pregnant, I gather. Except for the one person who already had a child and seemed to be going out with a gay man, as far as we could tell from the backstory. They, they flitted into other stories quite nicely. It resolved very oddly, whereby um, some of the protagonists really just joined together to, well, to tell Terry off and stamp on him, as far as I could gather. It didn't feel at all like it was going to go in that direction, um, but they stood up to the office hunk that was sleepy around, which may be cliched. Bearing in mind it's a relatively short piece, I think they actually put too many songs in it for the amount of plot they were trying to carry off, bearing in mind it ended so abruptly. I think the songs were um, effective for what they were trying to do. There was a couple of pop rhymes, I remember um, the occasional plural rhyming with a single, uh, that, that, that disappearing S in a rhyme which I find very offensive um, but on the whole the lyrics weren't at all bad and the music was quite jaunty. The, the company is called Girl Friday and um, rather splendidly they've, played, uh, they've put their mission statement on their advertising which is we pledge to test bosses and flirt with the most handsome white collar men around the country all in the name of musical theatre and you can't say fairer than that um that wasn't the only musical we saw though was it yesterday it was sunday we saw a musical called mod now what were you expecting from mod well, I'd read a couple of line blurb on it, and it was talking about um, someone wanting to become the fifth Beatle. So there was an element I thought it was, might be a bit angst-ridden, 
Liverpudlian chap sitting in a bedroom, not really, um, not really going going somewhere with his life. Whereas it turned out to be an American high school, almost Saved by the Bell esque mm. setup with geeks galore and running around, and almost you know in in that kind of high school musical tradition that um, should be wiped out from this planet. <laughs> oh, strong views there. Certainly, very much in the high school musical tradition. I don't necessarily mean the current Disney musical of that name, although of course that's just one more of a, a particular genre. Um, yes, it was a surprise. We start off in uh, an American high school, and there's Rory. It's set in the 60s, isn't it? I mean, everyone's got all the boys have got beetle wigs, or certainly our hero Rory has. Yeah. Dreams of being the fifth beetle, as you so rightly said, with his guitar, which only at the moment has two strings, but he's hoping to build up to four. And he's written a truly awful song called um, My Girlfriend's Got a Hickey, But I Didn't Give It to Her, yeah. which appears periodically. The story itself, I think, actually, for all its faults, I found it quite enjoyable. I mean, once I realised it was a, a, a high school musical, yeah. I, I just lay back and enjoyed it for what it was. And I thought the music, which was all in the style of original Beatles numbers, but not obviously original Beatles numbers, but an original score, um, heavy guitar, um, but not in the rock tradition, but in the pop tradition. Um, and it, it felt Beatles period sort of 63 to 65, 66 to me. The music was very much in the style of the early Beatles and worked reasonably, I think. The whole thing was excellently performed and done so with um, panache and pride that probably the, um, the writing didn't deserve. There were a couple of nice rhymes, but didn't fit in. And some of the songs were only maybe a verse and a chorus long, actually. And I think either had been cut down so much that they failed to form any kind of whole and serve any purpose or they um, or they are written as an afterthought uh, either way not really my cup of tea I must confess here that I rather enjoyed the piece actually um, as I've said already so you are getting a difference of opinion here which is healthy and I will of course be taking John into the corner and beating him later, later. Um, there was one song I particularly liked which is where one of the other couples who weren't the central couple um, the, the couple who were in trouble because the girl actually fancied Paul McCartney um, the young man eventually plucked up courage to tell his girlfriend that um, he really resented and indeed hated Paul McCartney. Uh, and there was this lovely um, song whereby every rhyme rhymed with Paul. Mm. So I don't feel so tall when you're with Paul and um, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. I thought it'd been so much more ambitious if the whole musical was about take that and, and being, um, being in love with Jason Orange. But um, <laughs> it would have been nevertheless. Um, never, yes, I, I thought it was quite inventive. Obviously, um, Every every other line ending with the the ending all is um, somewhat trying after a while, but it was a clever idea and not partic- but not particularly well executed. I thought I thought that was one of the parts where oh uh, the writing let it down. I thought you know this in contrast with the last show, Mod um, had it was some really excellent performance from some very young performers. Um, whereas the last show I thought was acted well, but a mediocre performance, but was an excellent script and Sex, Lies and Hazard Tape managed to deliver comic lines in a way that this didn't. Mm. And it was, um, so I think they're very contrasting as, you know, as the pieces. And just to finish, John, um, of course now you've been to the Edinburgh Fringe on many more occasions than I. Any observations about this year in particular or um, anything you've particularly enjoyed? I've noticed, I mean, just this year, projection seems to be in, in everything. Um, both of us have remarked on this. I've seen a good deal more musicals this year than I had before, which was zero before. I was quite impressed by the variety and some of the writing, but um, I think I'm not sure I will be visiting this many musicals in future. I think um, I've been disappointed by a lot of the performances that haven't seemed worthy of putting on at the fringe do justice to the fact that they've got a venue at the fringe and they've got a show that's worth putting on i've been disappointed by some of the singing but it's been a chance to see some new material that i wouldn't have, you know some new musicals that i wouldn't have had a chance to see um, otherwise and uh, so i'd be grateful for that well as john mentioned there there have been various trends which have been very obvious this year as you will have noticed in my reviews exclamation marks are everywhere um There's been a real turnover of shows. People have been running in and out of theatres. There's been a real move towards recorded music, and that's completely understandable. When you've only got half an hour to um, strike the set and get out of the theatre because someone else is coming in, um, you're not going to have an opportunity to set up an orchestra unless you're very lucky. There have been very minimal sets and props for exactly the same reason, and a huge amount of projection. In fact, um, it was rare to see a show that didn't have projection uh, for me. There's also been a real element of drag this year in Moby Dick. There was um, a fellow who dressed up as the headmistress, um, and in Iron Curtain there was a fellow who dressed up as a nun. Um, That's quite interesting. As John says, some of these things will survive and some of these things will disappear for us being too corny because they've all been done this year. Interesting thing to note, though. I really liked Sex, Lies and Hazard Tape, and I should say that Sex is S-E-C-S here. It means secretaries rather than uh, intercourse. And I like both 
that musical, and indeed Maud, a great deal more than my friend John there. Maud, I thought, was quite clever. Once you realise it was a high school musical, if you let that um, genre um, play out, then it was a great deal of fun. The opening number itself, bearing in mind it's a Beatles musical, was called Yeah, 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 Yeah. And there were some interesting lyrics. I see the dots connect, a lot's connecting. But the musical itself is about willfully living a fantasy and how that doesn't bring you happiness. But all in all, nearly everything I saw, and certainly Sex, Lies and Hazard Tape and Mod, were not the worst musicals I'd seen by any means. So, that's the end of my review of Edinburgh this year. It was fantastic. And what you don't get from a boring old radio programme like um, like this, with me just droning on, is a sense of the vibrancy of Edinburgh. It's a great place. If you get the chance to go to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, do. Go and see anything. Go and see comedy. Go and see theatre. I saw other things, not just musicals. I saw some stand-up. I saw a serious play with Dilly Keane from Fascinating Aida. But I saw a lot of musicals. And frankly... The great thing about Edinburgh is it's possibly the best place to see new musicals. There's not going to be much elsewhere. They don't come to London that often. I've described it really as an unparalleled joyful atmosphere at the festival. I I enjoyed it. I shall go again. And it's opened up a few musicals to me which I'd never get to see. Joining me, Thomas Ribbits, here on Musical Talk. If you want to phone in with your reviews of things you've seen at the Fringe or talk about any musicals, why not phone our special lines? Uh, If you're in America, phone 206 202 3848. And if you're in Britain, phone 0700 593 0764. I think we'll leave the last word to George Bush in a way that perhaps history won't let him do in any other circumstance uh, with this fantastic song from Tony Blair the Musical. And my thanks particularly to James Lark, who's allowed us to play some of these songs. Let's listen to Watch This Swing. There's a saying in old Texas that they say in Tennessee that says cool on me Shame on, shame on you, fool me See, the thing is most Iraqis Just want a world that's nice So it better find these people And we'll make them pay the price We, we want, want a war. war We'll hit Saddam Hussein Where he has not been hit before We, we want, want a war, war. And their homosexual stunts We ought to send them to Iraq And bomb them both at once We want a war We'll give Iraq a message That the world cannot ignore We want a war We'll kick it in the face Till it resembles Roger Moore Yes, to bomb them is a duty For the embitterment of men If there are bombs left over, then we'll bomb Afghanistan. The folk who conducted to act on freedom misunderestimated me. They misunderestimated our resolve and love for being free. They're hiding their weapons of mass production, or they just have to conflict more. This has been a production of Musical Talk, copyright 2007.